Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Please allow me to adopt the protocol that has already been established. Dr. Yannick Hume is a lecturer in cultural studies at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus, where she specializes in the multidisciplinary field of Caribbean studies with a focus on Cuba and Haiti. She received her PhD in 2008 from Emory University in comparative studies in culture, history, and theory. Her research and teaching areas include Afro-Atlantic religious cultures, the festive and sacred arts, cultural performance, popular culture, migration, and transnational identities. Dr. Yannick Hume is the co-editor of two critical volumes in the Caribbean intellectual tradition and is currently working on her book manuscript entitled Haiti in the Cuban Imaginary, Culture, I Culture Identity sorry, and Performance of Diaspora which examines the multiple meanings of Haiti in the Cuban context. Among her current projects also include a special issue with the Journal of African Religion on the aesthetic of death and an edited volume on the Caribbean mortuary complex, passages and afterworlds, which is due to be released in November 2018 by Duke University Press. Dr. Hume is the recipient of grants from the Social Science Research Council, the International Development Research Center, Ford Foundation, and the Wenner Gren Foundation for Anthropological Research. Outside of her academic work, Dr. Hume is a professional dancer and choreographer who has worked with the National Dance Theater Company of Jamaica and Danza Caribe of Cuba, she has also worked for the past two decades with Jamaican modern dance company, La Catco, as both dancer and choreographer, and toured extensively across the Caribbean, Latin America, and Europe. This evening, she will address the topic, Baliso, Heritage, Memory, and the Ancestral Legacy of Garifuna Identity. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Yannick Hume. While that gets assembled, um, the Honorable Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, uh, Camilo Gonzalez, Minister of Finance, Sustainable Development, Economic and Information Technology, uh, the Speaker of the House of Assembly, Mr. Jomo Thomas, members of the Diplomatic Corps, President of the Garifuna Heritage Foundation, Mr. David Williams, Kalernago and indigenous chiefs, representatives of the broader Garifuna nation and other indigenous leaders and elders from Guyana, Suriname, Dominica and Belize to my gracious hosts, Chair of the Conference Committee, Vanessa de Messiaen, Chair of the Evening's Proceedings, Mr. Ronnie Daniel, colleagues, friends and esteemed guests, Good evening. It is indeed a tremendous and humbling honor to stand before you and to the many who have gone before, who laid the foundation of this majestic land, to offer the keynote address at this fifth annual International Garifuna Conference, organized around the theme of Balisu and its multiple meanings and possible trajectories. I wish to commence my reflective meditations with a call to remember, and I'll do this in the language of which I pray, Yoruba. O mi tutu, ana tutu, tutu ile, tutu odun, tutu ekun, tutu ocha, mo yuba olofin olorun olobari, mo yuba ororoni ala saudei, ala sunife, 
Oluruna la ye, Oluru eleni, Moyu ba seda, Mayu ba akoda, Moyu ba ye dun, Oni e dun, Odun ola, Moyu ba baba, Moyu ba ye ye, Moyu ba ele, Iba ye ba entunu, Bobo ekun. I pay reverence to our ancestors, both the known and the unknown, to the spirits of this blessed land that enshrines its very landscape, um, its very landscape of the indigenous and African heritage, to the defiant leader Chatoye, and to the many Kalanago and Garofuna warriors who gave their life for the cause of freedom. I pay you homage in pouring libation to refresh and awaken your presence as I ask you to clear a pathway for me to offer my words. I stand this evening fully aware that it is through first recognizing and honoring the indomitable spirits of those that have come before that we can move towards fashioning a more just and inclusive future. I will be speaking essentially in two registers this evening. One is an anthropologist presenting an ethno-historical overview um, of a history that many probably know quite well. I'll try to edit as I go along. And then I will switch to a more applied sustainable development voice when I reflect on tourism policies and the potential for exploitation of a different tourism model. Baloso, heritage, memory, and the ancestral legacy of Garofana identity, fashioning a model of diasporic tourism. The sea was rough that day. The water swelled with greater intensity as the boat drew closer to the desolate island in the distance. As the jagged edges of the hilly terrain became more pronounced, the emotions of those sharing in the moment grew even more palatable. Amidst the crashing of waves, silence befell uh, those assembled, as though brought back to a time before this time. Some wandered off the vessel in a daze onto shore. Others stepped with great trepidation as the boat undulated, making finding ground difficult. Before long, the air filled with a deep, hollow, primal sound, one that was in part muffled by the sand, but also stirring up from the depths of deep sorrow. Outstretched in a fetal position, hand grasping the cold, damp sand, she wailed, screamed, and bawled, while others with their tears flowing understood her pain, for it was theirs as well. Not all made this historic journey to Balasso in the inaugural conference of March 2012, but the stories of those that journeyed across the choppy Caribbean Sea to the site of their beginning on the side of the Atlantic speaks to us several intersecting narratives that form part of my reflections today. Most notably, I'm interested in the manner in which these multiple crossings, spatial dislocations, and by extension, interconnected geographies of Garufana identity and memory can be mobilized within the popular consciousness of intentions to shift uh, the silences of the past. The history of the incredible formation of Afro-Indigenous subjectivities while now receiving some attention, have been mired by the violence of the archive, the dominant narrative of extinction, as well as systematic suppression and erasure of the indigenous past from the public domain and popular imaginary. As a result, while the emotive saliency um, embedded in the word Yuromi, or homeland, resonates as part of the foundation of the identity and collective memory for those who identify as Garifuna, the potentialities of mobilizing around such a concept have yet to be fully realized. However, the ancestral heritage and identity infused in the, into the local terrain, the land, as our esteemed prime minister has indicated, is what I will argue is a just the greatest resource Vincentians and the Garifuna people more, more globally and generally have as they attempt to resurrect and reclaim the, par the primacy of this once island reserve as not only being a site of freedom, but also a space where an alternative to the predominant imperial model was first realized. In my focus on Balasso as a specific site of trauma, or what Pierre Noir would call a lieu de mémoire, or a site of memory, 
I'm reminded of other such spaces on the African continent. In particular, Gori Island off the mainland of Senegal comes to mind. The castles that served as transshipment points for scores of African people along coastal Ghana, most notably Almina and Cape Coast, each of which display the infamous door of no return, also resonates with me. These four locales, situated in distinct spaces across the Atlantic Basin, are tied together by the shared history of rupture and suffering spawned down by the cruel processes of imperial expansion. However, what separates Balasso from these other more notorious places is the fact that it is the symbolic site of ethnogenesis or origin for a clearly demarkable, definable ethnicity with a shared language, cosmology, and socio-historical formation. Furthermore, Balasso was an island with no physical structure erected by colonial authorities, but instead a barren in hospital terrain used to sequester those deemed a threat to the imperial master's vision of conquest and exploitation. Unlike the ports of Africa, where those that were assembled were captured from diverse territories, spoke different languages, maintained varying customs, and hailed from distinct ethnic backgrounds stretching along the west coast and central to southern Africa, Baloso was a land where Garinagu or Garufana identity was inscribed into the very landscape. The fact that the fact uh, that remains of over 2,500 of the original 5,000 or so prisoners are embedded in the land and also speaks to the deeply tangible sacred roots of ancestral origin. Balasso, therefore, is not a random space or vestige of the past or simply a place of genocide, but the actual physical repository of trauma, memory, roots, and more poignantly, beginnings. I say beginnings because for those who survived the regime of terror exacted against them and endured on the land that was believed would annihilate them, Balasso became that point of departure, which was to extend to further cultural evolutions and diasporic horizons. The question that arises from this knowledge is how best to honor and pay justice to this history in the now. Given that Garifuna communities are among the largest living examples of the survival of the indigenous past in the present, that is, as a population that crosses several historical constellations and geographies, what is the role that St. Vincent and the island of Balasso specifically could play in safeguarding the history and memorializing, in, in, and memorializing sorry, the past, while also affirming the defiance and existence of a vibrant Garufana cultural present, defying the myth of extinction. Any understanding of the indigenous Caribbean present requires a bracketing of the myth of extinction that served as the master trope within Caribbean historiography. From the diaries of Columbus to the, to the commentary of European sojourners, missionaries, and planters, from the larger islands of the north to the smaller windward islands of the eastern Caribbean, a familiar narrative of annihilation unfolds. The broad outlines of this history are well known, and there are those of cataclysm. Europeans arrived in the so-called New World and were very quickly destroyed and very quickly, sorry, destroyed the populace and thriving native worlds through a combination of military conquest, enslavement, and disease. The near and dramatic obliteration of many indigenous settlements in the Greater Antilles at the time of the arrival of European settlers has tended to overshadow the tremendous diversity in these communities and the varying historical de development of Carib or Kalanago communities in the South and Eastern Caribbean. My deliberate use of the more accurate name Kalinago, even though the historical records that I re reference prefer Carib, is an attempt to reclaim the power of the indigenous, the power of the indigenous name. The popular nomenclature of the time, yellow, red, or black carob, were de decisive labels to draw divisions between African indigenous and Afro-indigenous people. And while, and while it's at times a successful in its purpose of rendering these identities distinct, there was a lot more shared across these supposed and forced divides. 
the shared humanity of a people yoked to a tumultuous history of battling for self-actualization is a more unifying bond than the pigmentation of skin or whether born in the Americas or transshipped from Africa. Notwithstanding the existence of Kalinago communities, two centuries after the first European landing, large-scale destruction of indigenous populations bore witness to an even more detrimental and pervasive erasure that has continued into our contemporary understanding of the region. Thus, we are forced to ask, how does one exercise agency or assert their presence when history proclaims him or her to be non-existent? The devastation most often invoked when speaking about European indigenous contacts in the Caribbean, while vital to our understanding of the history of the region, is only part of the story. Like other indigenous populations, those of the Caribbean have been subjected uh, for centuries to narratives in which they are doomed, vanishing, always on the verge of becoming nothing more than a memory. And yet the indigenous Caribbean is still here in communities who identify as such, as well as in many of the life ways and cultural practices of the region. They have been told they are vanishing for over 500 years, but have refused to do so. As testament, we had a full front row representative of this legacy and this presence. As historian Maximilien Forte reminds us, and I quote, concerted efforts in shrouding indigenous identities in an aura of primitivism, backwardness, ignorance, poverty, and even cannibalism would ensure that many modern prospective claimants to an indigenous identity would at least pause with the realization of the social stigma accompanying indigeneity in the Caribbean. In systematically denying such an identity, coupled with prevailing extinctionist narratives, have served to not only perpetuate the genocidal process, but have also displaced the rights to make claims to land, and in the case of St. Vincent, inhibit the mobilization of a viable mark of identity that is wedded to the land of ethnic origin itself. It is not accidental that for the enslaved Africans tied to the plantation economy of its eastern neighbor Barbados, St. Vincent represented a refuge, a space to chart a different path, and a land of relative freedom. It is in fact the drastically distinctive vision of land, its uses and symbolic significance as a site of sovereignty and agency that we see the traumatic, um, the traumatic uh, European but mostly British battle with the Kalinago unfold. Indigenous peoples in the Caribbean developed very different social economic and political systems in varying parts of the Caribbean. While in the larger territories, indigenous communities practiced more large-scale agricultural production and had a more institutionalized social hierarchy, those in the, Carib in the Eastern Caribbean were organized into relatively smaller, mobile, and more egalitarian units centered around small-scale farming and fishing. The communities that settled there were extremely transient and they carried on regular trade across the region and with South America, with which they, li they likely had sustained interaction. The surrounding ocean, writes David Waters, acted as an aquatic highway linking their islands and cultures rather than as a water barrier separating them. Seems that we have to take a lesson from that history. <laughs> well, okay. This mobility and access and use of the land was indicative to how Kalinago people identified as a community not separate and apart from the environment that was central to their existence, a re reality diametrically opposed to that which Europe represented. For Europeans, the region was considered free and up for grabs, available to the highest bidder. Thus, the right to land and the determination of its use in accordance with tradition, the cycles of the moon, the tides of the sea, and through the will of spirits and ancestors was juxtaposed against a detached colonial policy of rapid expansion and exploitation. Land thus became the principal idiom over which the struggle for self-determination and conquest played itself out. What is striking in the history of European expansion in Kalinago territories is how long they were able 
these being the Kalinagos, to maintain this alternative social and economic structure in the face of increasing pressure and encroachment. They did so in part by making use of the European presence, trading for goods with passing ships, even collaborating at times with settlers, mastering the art of diplomacy, while also fighting fiercely to maintain control and autonomy both over geographical space and their right to use it as they wished and saw fit. So who are these people we call the Gar Garinagu or Garifuna? The rugged mountainous terrain of St. Vincent and Dominica rendered these first, quote, Indian reservations of the Americas home to a heterogeneous group of refugees identified firstly by the Spanish as Carib. Over two centuries, however, these territories became home to not only those claiming indigenous status, but the abode of Maroons from neighboring Barbados and later the creolized Afro-Indigenous or Garifuna people. French missionary Father Lobin describes St. Vincent as, and I quote, the center of the Carib Republic. And it became the center for a century of renewal and resistance to European colonialism. This is a critical mark of distinction and one in which needs to be harnessed for any social, cultural, or economical development scheme moving forward. And I'll say it again, that St. Vincent was dubbed the center of the Carib Republic. The population of the island had, by the late 17th century, 200 years experience of European and of keeping them at arm's length, European encroachment and of keeping them at arm's length. During the same period, people of African descent were gradually incorporated into the indigenous communities in a process whose contours are, still, are difficult to con reconstruct accurately. There are almost no archival traces of the process, but language provides a, a clue. The communities that came to be known as the Black Caribs of St. Vincent speak the Kalunago language, with very few, if any, traces of African language. This may have been because escaped enslaved Africans arrived slowly and in small numbers so that they had little choice but to adopt the Kalunago language. Even if there were at times larger group of Ar Africans arriving in St. Vincent, they may have spoken many different languages. In this case, Carib would have served as a kind of common language or lingua franca, a bit like Creole, or what Haitian became in Haiti. Uh, the Africans adopted, as a quote, and were adopted by, argues Johnson. Sorry, the Africans adopted and were, ado and were adopted by, argues Johnson, the island Carib tongue and also its religion. A linguistic study done centuries later among the descendants of the black Carib in Honduras found this still to be largely true. They continue to speak a language very similar to that of the 17th century Kalonagos with a significant number of loan words from French probably incorporated during the 18th century. Um, this, this kind of focus on language became one of the kind of unifying force and reasons why UNESCO rallied behind this proclamation of this intangible heritage, this fear of the loss of language and what maintaining that would mean for the maintaining of this, actual, this identity. But there was, however, one telling and powerful mark of the linguistic impact of Africans. The word for person or persons, a key word, in the ban a key word is the Bantu term mutu. The fact that the term for this word, a rather central one in any language, person, came from an, Af from an African language is a striking trace of the broader ways in which various cultures and languages interacted and created a new culture over the centuries on St. Vincent. What transpired in St. Vincent, largely unobserved and undocumented by European colonialists, was a remarkable process of cultural encounter and inter-ethnic mixing. Over the course of two centuries, African and indigenous Caribbean life ways and visions shaped one another. The culture of the Kalinago itself was by the early 17th century shaped by interactions with European colonization as people of African descent, whether from slave ships or escaping from nearby plantation islands, joined these communities. They brought a variety of experiences and forms of knowledge. Coastal Africans, notes Johnson, were likely to have been excellent builders of large canoes and would have found 
uh, they had this in common with Kalinagos who had long constructed canoes that could carry 50 or more people up and down the archipelago. The increase in the number of Caribs of visible African ancestry was accompanied by the French and British colonial articulation of a narrative that denied the Caribness of so-called black Caribs. According to the narrative, the black Caribs originated in a slave ship bound for Barbados that wrecked off the coast of St. Vincent. The St. Vincent Caribs rescued and in some accounts enslaved the Africans, but the blacks multiplied more rapidly than the yellow Caribs, and the two groups went to war. Major John Scott, appointed royal geographer for his expertise on the mainland of Ischiabo region, made first mention of this shipwreck in 1661 and gave the date as 1635. French missionary Sieur de Labo repeated this date in 1674. Governor of St. Vincent, Valentin Morris, repeated this shipwreck story in 1777 but the date had changed to about 1712. He noted that the blacks, and I quote, so nearly extirpated the original possessors of the land that scarce 40 of them now remain alive. In 1794-5, Sir William Young, son of the British Land Commissioner in St. Vincent at the end of the Seven Years' War, gave the date of the shipwreck as 1675 in his account of the black charibs in the island of St. Vincent. The shipwreck story established a legal fiction according to which black Caribs were really Maroons who had never been adopted into Carib society. St. Vincent's remaining Caribs endured further forced removal to the remote northeast of the country where British authorities designated a small area for a reservation. The origins of St. Vincent's modern day Carib ter territory the St. Vincent Carib territory has never had anything approximating the same recognition from the colonial government as its counterpart in Dominica. The 17th and 18th century colonial insistence that blackness had destroyed St. Vincent's Carib heritage preconditioned the legal invisibility and impoverishment of the island's Carib territory. The Vincentian Carib territory absence from the legal landscape of indigenous rights is reflected in scholarly silence on its historical significance. Contemporary scholars Kenneth Kippel and Kremlin Ornelas invoke Thomas Atwood when they note that after the 1797 exile, the 20 or 30 families reported in Dominica were the only true Caribs remaining in the whole of the Caribbean region. Philip Boucher goes even further to state that there were very few pure Caribs by 1900 perhaps four or five at St. Vincent, and rather more at Dominica. That the Garanagu or Garifuna emerged as a distinctive African indigenous identity in the belly of imperial encounter reflects a protected history of cultural formation and indeed struggle. While the popular narratives tend to narrowly center around the fated 1635 shipwreck, Closer analysis of the colonial records reveal a more layered and complex history of inter-ethnic alliances, but also a history of movement, negotiations, and erasures. While what have developed as Garifuna identity was further honed in the coastal zones of Central America, most notably Honduras, Belize, parts of Nicaragua, Guata uh, Guatemala, and further afield to diaspora cities in the global north, such as Los Angeles and New York, Yoromin has been embedded in the history as a sacred place of origin. St. Vincent also remains a touchstone in Garufana's spiritual life. Central to their practice are the work of what are called Bouye, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, or shaman, a Carib term describing those who communicate with the spirits of ancestors. These spirits are understood as living in St. Vincent, and they have to travel across the waters to come to speak with the Bouillie. Sometimes, too, they are called to participate in large uh, multi-dimension ceremonies known as Dugu, which are held when a particular family ancestor has shown their displeasure by causing sickness or misfortune. These rituals, write Virginia Kearns, center on mourning, the remembrance of the dead, and are occasions when the living and the dead enjoy themselves. It is a thrill when the ancestors appear, writes Nancy Gonzalez. 
People laugh, cry, dance, hug and kiss and generally behave as, the, as they would at a family reunion. These ceremonies are usually led by the women in a given family and are an occasion that brings the family, including those who have migrated away from the villages, including to satellite diaspora communities in the United States, back together. The returning ancestors expects a feast and a few days before the Dugu begins, men and women go out into the coastal waters. They return at dawn of the third day, writes Kearns, with their catch, fish, conch, crab, crabs and other fruits of the sea, and the ceremony begins. The ancestors themselves are seen as making the same journey, arriving across the waters of St. Vincent. The altars of the Dugu and, and other ritual events often, according to Paul Johnson, have miniature hammocks, canoes, and sailing vessels on them. And during rituals, participants recapitulate and remember repose in St. Vincent by resting in hammocks. Our journey has been, set, has been sad, my grandchild. The ancestors sing in one song. We have been searching for our grandchildren. We have been crossing the deep ocean for our descendants far away. With these words, the ancestors insist on connections across the generations on the continuity that stretches back to the forests of St. Vincent and continues into a garfana future in Central America, New York, Los Angeles, and beyond. Recalling the names of one particular group of Caribs on St. Vincent, the Orayana, the song is a popular reminder too of the distance traveled, the losses of one shore, and the opening of another. We have been standing on the shore of Orayano, on the resplendent shore of Orayano, shedding tears. Historian and religious scholar Paul Christopher Johnson pointedly argues, and I quote, St. Vincent acquired the prestige of a place of origin and was transformed from a lived to an imagined place, a diasporic horizon of mythic status and a standard to gauge the religious identity performed on the Central American coast. St. Vincent was marked as the place from, the ancestral, from which the ancestral spirits come. The work that we are therefore charged to do uh, in my view, involves a process of rehabilitating the primacy of this land, reinvigorating some of those primal rites of celebration and remembrance. What I'm proposing in an investment um, in terms of thinking through how we tie land, history, identity, and the sacred together is through a concept of diasporic tourism, diasporic slash heritage. And I recognize you know, some kind of wince at the concept of tourism, but diasporic tourism focuses on trans migrants whose socialization networks, values, and heritage, heritage links them to communities and kinship ties in their birth country or that of their ancestors and who travel back to these communities primarily to reconnect with the people and the locale. And I'm recalling um, this lady's hair presentation when, when offering greetings from the Garifuna community in Belize, this sense of St. Of, um, Vincent being, or Yoramin being a kind of Mecca for the Garifuna community. An idea that one must travel there before actually making the journey to the other world, right? So it's like one, uh, uh, a rite of passage that one must go through. Tourism, while seen as a blessing for some and a curse for others, can become the central ground through which sequestered histories can enter into public discourse and debate. Through reimagining and branding specific locales as unique heritage sites that allows uh, one to experience spaces in a more profound ways. Contemporary research on tourism and its shift in the um, across you know, small island developing states, as well as larger territories, speaks to the very idea of the experiential, that the sun sea, sun, sea, and sand model of escape, is it holding or attracting um, visitors? And in fact, our ministries of tourism have failed in terms of reaching key target communities. 
we tend to have left out the diaspora. We tend to not cater to their needs and recognize that the ties to homeland isn't just uh, existence for the first generation, but in fact extends beyond several de generations. And it becomes a tool for teaching, a tool for relearning, a tool for reconnections. Interestingly, um, what Balasso lacks in terms of a built heritage, um, it has in terms of mythology, but more importantly, the land as tangible resource. Now, most of what we have exploited in terms of heritage tourism is in fact not the history of the people who make this region their home, but in fact the history of the colonizers. You just have to take a stop, just think about all those spaces we identify as heritage sites. They tend to be actually built heritage spaces like forts. What else? This is where I move into a more dialogical mode. So you could throw out to me, so I know we're getting tired, we're getting hungry, it's a long night, but where, where are some of those spaces that we conceive of heritage tourism projects? Cannons, yeah, right? Sorry? Uh-huh. So there's a, these, and also the kind of plantation houses, right? So there's a way in which um, we prop up, we continually prop up and, and um, filter our modern progressive Caribbean lifestyles through the, the filtered lens of the great house of the plantation house, right? So uh, your trip to Jamaica isn't complete if you don't go to Rose Hall. Likewise, your trip to uh, Barbados must include a visit to St. Nicholas Abbey. So there are spaces in which these sites become embroiled within the very understanding of those, those locales. But in order for Balusso to enter into another reckoning, it does require a systematic campaign of cultural renewal, branding of not solely a Garufana homeland imaginary, but it must reach out to a broader indigenous Caribbean and, and actually going to those spaces, much like earlier, um, uh, the earlier generations of Garufana folk traveling the, the, the seaways, right? Rekindling those connections making heritage trails that are in fact part of the marine lively, the marine kind of satellites that Garufana, Kalonago, Carib um, generations of people have traversed, right? So rekindling those, those, those uh, seaways. The varying roots of Garifuna history is quite expansive, as I've previously indicated, but the roots of remembrance is best captured in the Garifuna Settlement Day and reenactments. Uh, before I get to that, I just want to, some of my work around heritage sites is also looking not only at the intangible history, but looking at specific sacred sites. These are just a list of what is um, identified within the UNESCO um, listing of sacred sites of the Caribbean. We see Belize, Cuba has two sites, uh, Basilica of Al Cobre, and as, as well as the Santuario Nacional de San Lázaro. There's also the DR, which has, I believe, the most of the identified sacred sites, along with um, Haiti. So you have the, Basil the Basilica Catedral, Nuestra Señora de Alta Gracia. Actually, all one, two, three, four of the sites within the Dominican Republic are churches built during the time of um, soon after Columbus's arrival. Haiti, you have several sites, and what's interesting about Haiti, and perhaps an example of which a space like Balasso could, uh, which St. Vincent could actually argue for a space of Balasso, is that not only does it include um, shrine spaces, which are, inher which are inherently part of the landscape. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the way in which Vaudun ceremonies unfold, but the peristyle or the umfo, the temple space, is a fluid space. So you have a thatched roof, but the sides are open that pours out into the landscape. And Haiti as well has a waterfalls identified as a specific site. 
Now the conundrum that we find ourselves in in terms of what do we rescue or resuscitate of Balusu is that it is barren. But its barrenness is also its potency. It's also its power because it, it triggers that same level of longing, of loss. And the idea around diasporic tourism is that it operates around these poetics of nostalgia. It operates around this longing, these ideas of loss, what I think English doesn't really capture certain emotive things. It just doesn't quite do it. But we could think of the Brazilian saudade and what that means, even when it's uttered, saudade, that, that longing for something that is kind of in reach but not quite, right? That longing of reconnection. And when I started with the vignette that opened uh, my, my discussion so far, this tonight, it was about how is that longing embodied? It is not a longing that is cerebral. It's a longing that takes on corporal dimensions. It is felt at the cellular level. And the thing about branding within this notion of a diasporic heritage tourism, it is to capitalize on that poetics of nostalgia. Um, there are certain sites, I don't know if you may be familiar with this space. Anyone might know what this, the image represents? But before I get to that image, <laughs> um, I want to turn quickly to the Garifuna Settlement Day re reenactment, which commenced in 1941 and have been part of a kind of festival economy of Belize. But more importantly, it is the publicly recognized day that celebrates this population and their history. The question that this reenactment celebration brings up for me is what precludes developing events or a site for learning about the historical beginnings of the Garifuna in the land that is the place of its origins? It seems as though Garifuna history starts elsewhere in terms of what happens around how it's packaged, how it is imagined, how it is lived, how it is embodied. Erasure and social amnesia in this land, in Eurome, was almost complete. And we see, and I commend the, the efforts of the Garifuna Heritage Foundation in resuscitating that very history, but it's, it cannot just exist within the space of dialogue. It has to exist in the space of experience and experience that is curated. That's why I speak to you know, tourism, but also speaking to a way in which we could perhaps think through museum spaces. I spent some time, I worked prior to entering the academy at the Smithsonian, and one of the, the, the wonderful um, experiences coming out of that was as a, you know, a person growing up in a post-colony, Museums, I didn't think were a space for me to even reflect on my history. Um, it seemed so, re so removed. Um, the narrative seemed so outside of who I thought myself to be, in part because some of the, in the traditional exhibiting practices were about erasing the history of the local population. But how, if, how about kind of taking already the emotive power of the land of Balasso and when we think about reparative, rep, um, reparative justice, like what are we going to do with that money, right? So if we could get that money and invest it in to something that makes more money. So it's not just about uh, solving an issue in the moment, but investing that money into projects that could actually sustain livelihoods, sustain economies. Um, I do wish to reflect momentarily on the need of mobilizing around diasporic affiliations and building a tourism project that specifically focus on branding a sacred heritage site. And that involves a not too difficult process. As we are reminded, the Garifuna um, culture, lifeways, have already been identified by UNESCO as 
as part of the proclamation of intangible heritage of world cultures. But it takes then for the Garifuna community globally to push and ask for the deeming of Balasso as a sacred site of origin, and by extension, or I should say St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and is specifically Balasso as that sacred site. And because of these conventions require, as part of the stipulations in Article 14, it requires a revisiting, a, consist, a continual revisiting of what is identified as heritage and how you could then further market and expand on which of, of that which has already been identified as something of significance for world culture. I'm almost wrapping up. Um, so building this tourism project specifically focuses on branding a sacred heritage site created in the mainland and also on Balasso, which would include an interactive museum, heritage trail, and a monument to Chateauier. Maybe I'm missing it, but is there one? I remember, you know, my first, second, third, this may be my fourth, searching, thinking I must have missed it, and asking, did we go past it? And I just didn't see it. And you, we have a history of creating monuments in the region. We love looking at dead people, but we don't like looking at ourselves. And so there must be a monument to Queen Victoria to almost all of the isles that were once British owned. We have monuments to French leaders. We have monuments to Josephine without a head. We have monuments to Solo II. So we have, you know, in places like Guadeloupe, a revisiting, revisiting of that monumental history. And I caution against us just creating or erecting a bronze model that no one kind of deals with, like the one in, uh, in Barbados that is a representative of, you know, of, emancip of emancipation, yet you're going around a roundabout, so you can't really contemplate it, right? And so how do we begin to anchor this history through these processes, through, and I'm not at all naive in thinking that money's just gonna fall from the sky, because these invest, these projects require serious money, serious investment. Um, and so I uh, draw my initial examples in terms of thinking through what did other spaces do. Um, I draw my initial examples of developing roots of remembrances through promoting diasporic tourism at sites of trauma, um, through looking to Africa. And I return to that space in which I, those spaces I mentioned in the beginning, because I remember vividly the first time going on a boat, much like the first time going on a boat to go to Balasso, those same emotive uh, vibrations echoed in my first experience of going to Gori Island. And it represents an interesting kind of parallel of leaving a mainland on a ferry and going through relatively treacherous waters to then get to this island. But the difference between Gore and Abaloso is that Gore is lived on, it is inhabited, its culture is vibrant. And so there's, they, there were things in which to sell and to model and to be able to experience. And it had the actual built structure of the dungeons. The power of the diaspora, however, for the development of African societies what not, was not lost on independence leaders. From the late 1950s, countries such as Ghana recognized the power of the diasporas in energizing shared cultural connections, but also recognizing that these, inviting the diaspora back home could help to stimulate and resurrect economies, but also deeper cultural connections. In 1966, under Leopold Senghor, there was the hosting of the Festival of Black Arts. This festival was followed by the grandeur, the grandeur Second World Black and Art Festival of the Arts and Culture, Festac, which was a festival held in Nigeria in 1977. Locating these festivals in Senegal in 1966, 
in Nigeria in 1977, positioned them as the self-designated homelands of the black diaspora. What prohibits you or me from that type of festivalizing of which indigenous cultures, not just Garufana, but indigenous cultures from across the region centers around this rock in celebration of Garufuna identity. Remember, 19, the, the first uh, festival of black arts, spearheaded by Senghor, followed on the heels of independence. They were, they didn't have the means to make it happen, but they made it happen for, because the will was there. And we also got the buy-in from the diaspora. So what I'm saying is that we must find ways of really mobilizing around the diaspora economies that have formed in the global north, but also the interconnections of broader communities of, um, of Caribbean, of Carib, of Carib, sorry, of Kalinago and indigenous history. I'm just gonna quickly go through where we are here. Some of the stakeholders that are involved in diasporic tourism, we see that we have the enablers, the facilitators and intermediaries who are these diasporic tourists. So it's a complex matrix that I'm speaking of. It's not just something you know, that just happens by erecting a building. And the rationale, the idea of bolstering cultural confidence, strengthening the indigenous components, um, establishing further ties across those indigenous communities, enhancing the destination branding, making the product that we sell as tourism distinctive and experiential beyond San, Sea, sex, sun, and rum, right? Um, breaking away from commodity tourism and relying on being able to think about what it means to bring forth uh, uh, a new way of perceiving, protecting sacred sites. Um, so I wanna just close by returning to the idea that many indigenous, aboriginal, First Nations peoples maintain about land. Land holds memory. It vibrates like our cellular structure. The sand, the, the rocks, the stone, the earth, the trees, the wind that moves by it brings us back to that first being, that primal being. And it is about recognizing this, honoring this, memorializing, and finding a way to erect strategies whereby we could enhance a greater understanding, but also profit from the land itself. And I thank you very much for your time.